Maslow's classical music collection, just a part of my collection and a little discussion, uh, how I got into classical music. Now, now don't run away, don't run away, okay? This video was inspired by Michael. Uh, his channel is Poetry on Plastic, and he probably is the premier classical channel that I know of, at least a part of the vinyl community. And I know there's not a big, uh, I don't want to say love, but big knowledge of classical music in the um, the vinyl community. I know enough to get me in trouble, and I'm going to showcase that. But I want to talk about a couple of things here first about this. Um, Michael did a video recently, uh, a few weeks ago, of 25 albums to get you into classical music. It's a fabulous video. I'm going to link it below. You should subscribe to his channel. Listen, I did a video the other day where I included a couple of jazz records, and some guy... Um, you can, you can look comments on some of my, uh, my actually, I think one of them was my uh, top 20 uh, records or box sets from 2020. And he freaked out when I, every time I showed a jazz record, it's got some of a Beatle channel name, Beatle related channel name. More jazz records? I'm out of here. So enjoy learning about something new. I watch heavy metal channels. I'm not a big heavy metal guy, but um, one of my favorite channels is Aaron. Um, Aaron's channel about heavy metal music. Uh, it's just, it's, 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 I like him sitting around vaping and uh, talking about records. I have no idea what he's talking about. He does talk about avant garde uh, jazz as well. But anyway, this is not about that. So I'll put a link below. Uh, check out Michael's Poetry in Plastic. He may, he's a, he's a uh, oboist in the, uh, I, as I, I think it's the Philadelphia Symphony. Of course, uh, there's a lot of time on his hands now since there's no performing live, and it's really kind of a shame. But um, he knows a good amount about uh, classical. I'm going to show, from my point of view, what I got into, where it came from, and some of my favorites. And again, I'm not going to get into the pressings or the performances much because I wouldn't be able to talk about that like Michael because... You could show, in fact, we did a, a, a Four Corners on classical music, and um, I could show a Stravinsky, which I did, and he can tell me that that's not a very good performance. And, you know, we all learn these things, and, you know, I enjoy it for what it is, and I'm not going to get pretentious, and he's not pretentious in his presentation of classical music, so classical music, so learn something. Um, I've showed this a couple times, and I'm just going to, my genesis of classical music goes back to uh, the Beatles' help soundtrack, the American soundtrack, uh, with Prelude to Lohengrin, Act 3, you know, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, um, which is Wagner, also, and that's not on the soundtrack, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, my all-time favorite piece, and that was used there, and of course, later, Clockwork Orange, um, and in 1968, uh, this is one of the biggest selling classical musics of all time, and especially in 1968, a lot of rock people, a lot of people who weren't familiar or even interested in classical music would buy it. this Walter Carlos, now Wendy Carlos album of Switched on Bach. Very early uh, album using uh, the Moog synthesizer. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful record. And obviously uh, he, she went on to do work with Stanley Kubrick on the soundtrack of um, Clockwork Orange. Uh, but also 2001 A Space Odyssey, which I've showed ad nauseum on this channel and I love that and that was a big introduction to me on classical music that's a little out there not just the Blue Daniel by Strauss but also Strauss Zarathustra by um, the other Strauss jo not Joanne Strauss Richard Strauss um, Richard Strauss now I'm going to pronounce some of these names wrong and if Michael was here I, I wish I would have a little circle your uh, inset of Michael there, <laughs> translating these and putting uh, the right pronunciation to some of these composers and performers. But um, I'm going to move ahead into 1973 when I got my first um, job working in a record store, the Warehouse Records, a California-based uh, chain. What's interesting about that, that was a great education for me because their classical section was not organized by composer or performer so you could look under Bach you couldn't look under Bernstein for Leonard Bernstein or uh, Von Karahan for the conductor or Wagner you had it was all organized by Schwann catalog number 
that's kind of a what the fuck moment when you really think about it and looking back on it. But I tell you, I learned a lot. Now, the Schwann catalog, I'm going to show you a few covers of the Schwann catalog. Started in 1949 and was around either till the late 80s or 90s. Gives you an idea. There was these catalogs that were, it was a monthly and it was mostly classical records in it and most, and then some soundtracks. Later, I think they got into jazz a little bit, but it wasn't pop records very often or rock and roll. And it was a catalog of records. And we had those laying around um, the store that you could use as a reference or we would sell. But all the classical records were organized by Schwann catalog number. So if someone came in and wanted, I want a Wagner symphony. You couldn't just send them over to W and put one in their hand and say, this is a really good symphony. You had it look by Schwann catalog number. So in a way, you had your Deutsche Grammophon records together, your Angel record, Angel, Angel Classics, uh, your budget labels like Seraphin Records, um, Columbia Masterworks, and so on. And it was by numbers. <laughs> so it was a shit show. It was so strange. And I worked there about a year and a half, maybe just shy of two years. But I learned of who composed for instance, operas, I got to know Puccini, I got to know, um, you know, Wagner, I got to know the Italian operas, uh, if not the music totally, although we did play them in the store, I got to know who was on what label, what conductor, Von Kerhen for Deutsche Grammophon, Bernstein for, uh, for Columbia Records, uh, and so on. That's the introduction, and uh, if you've held on this long, you can just see some of my records. So I'm going to show a pile of records, and again, they're kind of mixed match. There's no really thematic theme to them. And of course, there's a pile I got because of Michael's uh, 25 records you need to get into, which I'll kind of leave uh, till the end here. Um, and plus, I have some CDs because I really got into sort of minimal 20th century uh, music as well. So, of course, uh, Beethoven symphonies is uh, amongst my favorite. Um, I do have the uh, Von Karahan early 1960s. I used to have that box on vinyl and during my mid 90s purge, I got rid of it. I have it on CD. I know he did a digital version uh, later for Deutsche Grammophon. I have this version um, and this is the all symphonies. This is uh, the Berliner Strax Pell by Daniel Berenbaum, uh, conductor, all symphonies. Again, you know, my favorites are the, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth, I guess the odd ones, uh, but uh, really love that. I do have a several Deutsche Grammophon records that I've picked, re-picked up over the years, so I don't have a full box set. Uh, the number fifth symphony on Deutsche Grammophon, Von Karahan. Another Von Karahan, the Aroka Symphony. This is the um, symphony number three, Von Karahan. Uh, we talked about Stravinsky on a few uh, videos, and I was uh, pointed in the direction, and I think Stravinsky, that's a picture of Stravinsky, he, this is a version he conducted in the early 60s, I believe, as well. And a lot of people aren't a fan of this, and I think he wasn't even a fan of this. Uh, but I love this cover. I just love the graphic on this. I have another version of it, but um, this is a real, kind of a cool record. And there is an expanded CD version that came out in the last couple of years, sort of an anniversary uh, edition, but I just love that cover, so I couldn't resist. This is really um, sort of the beginning for me to, to get in some out there classical from my point of view, not the typical symphonies, um, the melodic symphonies, because I remember my dad playing things like Respigi, Pine of Rome, Pines of Rome, and Fountains of Rome, but very romantic um, classical music, which I'm not really a fan of. I got this for the cover, but I also like these old recordings of Caruso. Uh, we're going into opera now, and obviously for some opera is challenging. Uh, opera works to, for me best in person. I was fortunate enough because of some projects I worked uh, photography-wise uh, to work with the San Francisco Symphony and the San Francisco uh, Opera um, that I was able to go to a bunch of the operas at the San Francisco, one of the great uh, opera troops in America, as far as I'm concerned, and I saw a bunch of them, but it's all about the sets. I mean, you have to be in there for the long haul. Some of these are four or five hours long, 
um, but I saw some amazing. Um, I turned out uh, uh, by Puccini, I think, and um, Verdi's operas, so Italian operas, also some of the German operas. Uh, but this is a cool comp RCA Red Seal cool collection, uh, and the, you know these are very very old recordings, so it's it's amazing. In fact. I got a rebirth into the, of Caruso because of, and it was a 2007, Woody Allen's movie Match Point uses Caruso and opera uh, as sort of a soundtrack. Um, I'm going to just do the pile of records first, and so we're going in and out of order of genres of classical music, uh, classic things. This is a record I picked up in the 70s when I worked at the warehouse because there was a buzz of it. And of course, this was 10 years after this was recorded when I got it. And Harry Parch was an American composer who's also a carpenter that uh, he invented his own instruments, invented and built his own instruments. And this is a theater piece based on sort of a Japanese kabuki theater. So in a way, kind of samurai-esque of Japanese ghosts. Uh, it's called Delusion of the Fury, a Ritual of Dream and Delusion. And... Um, an incredible uh, collection and just to show you there is this amazing book that comes in it the Harry Parge and it goes through all the instruments again he invented and built all these instruments he's one of the initial um, considered one of the uh, sort of fathers of minimalism, although I think that wasn't, he didn't like to be called that or didn't feel that that was his uh, forte. And I'm not sure he wanted to be sort of involved in that, but um, that's how it goes. Another minimalist uh, who I was fortunate enough to actually meet once, I sat next to um, John Cage at a, a concert for with the Kronos Quartet. I'll show them here in a minute. Uh, Minimalist composer, avant-garde composer, uh, 20th century. Uh, this is uh, music for a keyboard, 1935 and 1948, prepared piano and toy piano. Of course, he's infamous, uh, like Yoko Ono, to have uh, pieces of music that are totally silent. And then there's a famous piano piece, or a, is it a piano, or an organ uh, that's been built that every year plays one note for it's going to go on for like 100 years or something early pictures of John Cage, but I was able to, I sat next to uh, John Cage and his partner, Merce Cunningham, the great um, ballet dance uh, director at a Kronos concert in San Francisco at the Herbst Theater, right next to the Opera House and the Symphony Hall. Uh, really interesting, but on a minimal uh, scale of things. So these, I just want you to kind of be turned on to this music a little bit. Now, part of my introduction to, uh, in the mid 80s, into some of this avant-garde, minimalist, what they would call 20th century uh, classical music was the Kronos Quartet. And I'm not gonna put out all, pull all of my CDs out because I have a ton of Kronos CDs, but several of them just, I'm going to put on for different reasons. One of my photographers, Michelle Clement, photographed this cover. Uh, the concepts were supposed to be like uh, German expressionist photography with the light and shadows. This is Winter Was Hard, a wonderful uh, album by Kronos Quartet. They are out of San Francisco. They've been around now since, God, since the 80s. Um, and they tour the world usually. And uh, there are a lot of uh, modernist composers that are commissioned to do special pieces of music for them, from the NEA, National Endowment of the Arts, to other uh, arts foundations. And on this particular album, there's Salome Dances for Peace uh, by Terry Riley, the, another great minimal, minimalist uh, composer, avant-garde artist. Um, and they, do, they have a whole CD of his work on this. This also has um, Forbidden Fruit, a version uh, written by John Zorn, the great kind of jazzy avant-garde uh, artist, uh, guitar player. And um, 
Bella by Barlight by John Lurie. John Lurie, another uh, musician from um, New York City, the East Village, uh, also an actor who was in uh, Stranger Than Paradise, a member of the um, East Village uh, avant-garde jazz outfit, The Lounge Lizards, Astor Piazzolla, uh, the Argentinian, not the accordion, the other instrument uh, player, <laughs> Uh, and so on. They have a Dodgio here by Samuel Barber, which became Berber, uh, Barber, which became sort of a famous piece used in a lot of motion pictures and, and soundtracks, and uh, some traditional things. So this is a great album, but they really switch it up. Uh, this is Pieces of Africa. Obviously, it has African leanings and African um, composers. This is um, one of the most recent I have. This is about five years old. This is Landfall. Uh, this is a piece written and a collaboration with Laurie Anderson, uh, the great uh, minimalist avant-garde artist as well. Fantastic record. And I'll just show, since we're in the uh, chrono section, if you really want to get a great, great overview, this is an amazing. This is a 25th anniversary of Chronos Quartet, a CD box set. has a beautiful book. has... 10 CDs of the best work, avant-garde work. Some of their work is just beautifully romantic and gorgeous, and some of it is very avant-garde. Uh, and they really um, they really push it. And what was great about Kronos, too, and some might say this is superficial, one thing that was really great, they were one of the first classical outfits to that their visual style was as important as their um, musical style. They were probably the first classical quartet that didn't, that wasn't always dressed up or hardly at all dressed up in tuxedos, the typical cliche symphony classical outfit. They had modernism, their image was very important, their style, that's why my photographer Michelle Clement worked on a lot of their uh, publicity photographs for many years. Um, and one, there was an initial documentary on Kronos uh, filmed at her studio. So they were, you know, they started out a little post-hippie period in the, um, in, the, in the 70s. And as the world turned, as avant-garde came about, as new wave and punk came about, they really um, were parallel force visually as well as musically. Again, they've worked with some of those amazing composers, everyone from Philip Glass to uh, Terry Riley to John Zorn and, and so many more. Tom Waits, a lot of pop musicians you may know of too. Uh, they also have a kind of a, a fun uh, cover of Jimi Hendrix's Purple Haze on one of their records. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a Mac Richter. German composer. This is Sleep. This is a, an ongoing, um, I think it's like a overnight eight to 12 hour original uh, piece of music where he had, they have groups of people sleeping while they're playing it. This is a condensed uh, two record set version of it. Uh, Richter has done a lot of soundtracks as well. Uh, this is an interesting one, Vivaldi, The Four Seasons, where he reconstructs uh, Vivaldi's Four Street Seasons. So there are various versions of it. Uh, so the first record basically has his whole reinvention and reimagination uh, and twisted version of the Four Seasons. And there's some electronic soundscapes by Max Richter and then remixes, almost like DJ dance mixes, electronica uh, remixes. Kind of an avant-garde album that really fuses classical music, 20th century, and uh, electronic music. Max Richter. I sound like I know what I'm talking about here, don't I? <laughs> Michael, pipe in. I wish you were here. Again, I want the little circle of Michael yelling out, Maslov, you're wrong. He was, she was, they were. Um, another person I'm influenced uh, by on the VC with this stuff is um, my friend Michael at Noted and Archive. Uh, his group, Bal Balmoray, originally out of Austin. Now Michael lives in... Um, Los Angeles. I'm not showing Balmoray Records, sorry, Michael. Uh, but they're also a hybrid in here of this neoclassical. I mean, there's all these names, and I kind of get cynical about names and music. I did a punk, my t favorite 20 punk 
uh, videos recently, and I got a lot of flack for people saying, uh, that's not punk rock, they're not punk flock, she's not punk rock, <laughs> Joy Division is not punk rock, Talking Heads not punk rock. Well, that was my vision, the, the essence of punk, and the the um, just the feeling of punk. No, it's not all hardcore Ramones or Bad Brains or or um, uh, you know Crime or those type of bands. And I certainly know their those bands. I saw them live all through the time, all through the day. Fear and all that. There's a, there's a feeling of type of music now. Neoclassical, modernist, minimalist. I'm just throwing these all together and mixing them all up. Uh, this is Rachel's. But anyway. What I was saying, Michael uh, shows these a lot, and I think he's worked with Rachel Grimes. This is a Rachel Grimes, essentially her solo record. She um, was part of the Rachels, and I have several other uh, records on Compact Disc I'm not showing here, but I'm just showing uh, the vinyl versions in her case. This is my favorite. Uh, this is music for Egon Schill, uh, the artist, a fine artist really beautiful but as i was saying balmoray i'm bouncing between topics here balmoray has an essence of classical also americana a little bit guitar more and guitar and piano based um every time i try to talk about your music michael i don't even know what to say about it uh they got signed by deutsche gramophone so i'm looking forward to their new album this, this spring and you should reorder it in fact i'll put a link down there to reorder it um to pre-order it. The Rachel Grimes uh, has sort of a beautiful, minimal, uh, just light feel and a, a gorgeous uh, series of records uh, under the uh, moniker Rachel's. This is from 1996. Um, we'll go to classical. I'll come back. Of course, go back to some traditional. These are amongst my very favorites. Uh, obviously, Gershwin uh, goes from pop symphonies to pop uh, song classics. I like this because this is uh, Gershwin recordings of and Paul Whitman, Morton Gould. So it goes in and Leonard Bernstein. It goes from pop to jazz of the day, big band too. But uh, this has uh, Rhapsody in Blue, American in Paris, of course, Rhapsody in Blue, one of his most famous pieces. Uh, and this is the uh, George Gershwin actually playing piano on it, so he's doing his own. Same with him uh, doing a Celeste sto uh, solo on American in Paris, Porgy and Bess, Strike Up the Band, and then solos from uh, Porgy and Bess. So this is kind of a, I, I like these archival recordings. I have several by different artists. Um, this is one I really enjoy too, and um, this is from a soundtrack, 20 two short films about Glenn Gould, uh, the great uh, Canadian classical pianist. An amazing uh, film of these short two-minute, three-minute films, and each one has a different piece of uh, music that he's performed, uh, like from Bach, Beethoven, Wagner, Schoenberg, Prokofiev, and so on. Uh, cool movie. Uh, this is a kind of interesting movie to get introduced in the classical music as well. So Glenn Gould, 20 more, 22 short films. Now, the six string quartets of Bartok. This is amongst my favorite too. This is a great listen. I love this. This to me is gorgeous. And this is uh, Tristan and Isolode by Wagner, Richard Wagner, of course, um, a favorite of mine. I used to refer to when I first started hearing Richard Wagner, uh, again from Prelude to Lundgren and uh, from Help, uh, Wagner's uh, work in Apocalypse Now. A lot, you know, his music's used for dramatic effect quite a bit, and in a way, he, I used to refer to him as sort of the Led Zeppelin of classical music. And uh, Michael, tell me if that's fair or not. And of course, the Rosary Sonatas by Bieber. And this is not Justin Bieber, of course. This is Heinrich Ignaz Franz. Bieber, or is it Biber? You say Bieber, I say Biber. Gloriously beautiful, uh, religious, uh, classical piece. Debussy and Ravel are two uh, composers I got into uh, during the period in the warehouse in the early 70s when I worked there because their stuff was very lush and very, I just remember it swirling around my head and 
fairly cosmic in a way. That's how I saw it. You know, I don't know how it was originally uh, perceived, but I really got into um, both uh, Debussy and Ravel at the exact same time. Uh, this is uh, my prelude to a font is not on here. Um, images, trois nocturnes, three nocturnes. And of course, a later, uh, San, well, not a later. This is bef This is after, let's see, I did follow the symphony from uh, Seju Azawa was uh, their conductor, and then Herbert Blomstead. And of course, uh, up until just this past year, Michael Tilson Thomas. And this is Hindesmith. Uh, this is one of the uh, first, I think, uh, I think digital recordings they were doing for DECA. This is 1988. I think I bought these because I was getting into this kind of stuff and I kept reading about Blum's. I think Blumstead had, had signed a new contract with London Records um, to put these out. Now, we get into the um, minimalist and one that became very popular, and that's um, Arbel Part Te Diem. Contemporary composer, uh, very minimal. These are recorded, I think, in, these are on ECM, some of these. ECM, another Arbel Part, and Arbel Part Litany. And of course, another one who, who got known. Around, there was a really kind of, I remember this resurgence or this in the 90s, um, late 90s or 2000s, uh, in San Francisco, uh, Tower Records opened a separate classical building across from right across the street from their famous iconic Tower Records on Columbus and Bay. The second Tower Records ever opened in 1968 in their classical. And I started buying things like Enrique uh, Gorecki. And this is a symphony number three. And of course, the one artist who really turned me on to a lot of this stuff in terms of minimalism, the repetitive nature, and you could really joke about the repetitive nature uh, of Philip Glass. Kalyanis Gatsi is an amazing piece of music. It was a semi-documentary, time-based uh, film, and he did the soundtrack for it. And Kalyanis Gatsi means life... Uh, out of balance and it shows you know the earth and time-lapse photography going through modern times and uh, it's from an Indian American um, Native American uh, Indian word Kalyana Scotsi of course there was a, a sequel of sorts Pawa Scotsi both are really good highly recommended films to see beautiful intense and you know it, it really shows uh, the yin yang of the, the peaceful earth versus the urban, crazy uh, uh, wor earth, world, cities we live in and, and now, too. An amazing piece of music. Uh, this is one amongst my favorite. Of course, it's been used to death in soundtracks and TV shows. Solo piano by Philip Glass. Kundan. Um, and this is a uh, Martin Scorsese picture. This is a beautiful score, Kundan. There's also one I don't have here, a soundtrack he did called Secret Agent which is amongst my all-time favorite scores by um, Philip Glass. And of course, then there's John Adams. John Adams has written symphonies and operas uh, on contemporary issues. Klinghoffer about uh, the Jewish gentleman who's in a wheelchair. Terrorists invaded a cruise ship and he was thrown overboard. There's actually an opera based on that. The Chairman Dances, this is uh, an excerpt. I used to have the full box set of Nixon in China, an opera he wrote, uh, of the meeting, uh, the mi meeting of the minds of Richard Nixon and Mao. Of course, the Rich Steve Reich now, uh, the desert music. Steve Reich variations. Amongst my favorite, now this is Steve Reich, Different Trains, a collaboration with the Kronos Quartet. And Steve Reich, Four Selections. Okay, I'm going to close out now with uh, some records I got turned on to by Michael and this and Michael and Michael and Michael, the three Michaels from the Four Corners, to, and they got me sucked into buying this amazing piece, um, Bach Starker. It's recorded in the early '60s, uh, and this is 45 RPM, eight LPs. 
solo cello. Now, I'm a huge solo cello fan. And if you, I got, you know, again, goes back to the Beatles, got turned on to cello because of the Beatles and um, the quartet in Eleanor Rigby, but more so Strawberry Fields and I'm the Walrus. Those deep, deep cellos are really wonderful. This is probably one of the most, this is the, one of the best sounding records I now own in my collection. Solo, you recognize some of the music right out of the gate. Uh, incredible record. This is a record I got for Record Store Day last year. Uh, Essential, Philip Glass. This is um, four LPs, and it has really an overview from his um, Columbia Sony Masterworks. So it's got everything from songs from Liquid Days, which he kind of joins forces with uh, people like Linda Ronstadt and the Roaches and other artists, but also some of his um, Metamorphoses, piano solos, as well as uh, Koyan Squatsi and some other things. So kind of a very cool collection. Nice overview. If you can find this, this is a, a wonderful introduction to Philip Glass. And then some QRP pressings on Analog Productions. Prokofiev. Um, I got turned on to this piece of music, the um, Lieutenant Kiev. Is that how it's pronounced? Michael? Uh, because of Woody Allen's Love and Death, the very end of the music, that beautiful piece of music when uh, death has taken him away and he's dancing with death, walking parallel to the camera uh, by those large, like, cypress trees or something. Love this. Of course, um, great 45 RPM version of the Royal Ballet. And this is gala performances. Uh, includes Swan Lake, the Nutcracker, Sweeping, Sweeping Beauty. A really wonderful overview. Bolero, everybody's um, sexual climax record <laughs> cliche. Um, this is a good recording. Uh, this is Charles Munch, conductor. What a great cover. Sounds amazing. I got a ver new version of this, of course. Um, Holst, The Planets. This is a really psychedelic. I mean, if you had a, if you put psychedelic in any way, this would be a psychedelic record, I think, in terms of classical music. That's what 2001 got me into. The, that the the wilder stuff on uh, that record reminds me of this too. Sherzad, beautiful recording. Fritz Reiner in the Chicago Symphony. It's a Rims Rimsky uh, Korsakoff composed piece. Probably one of the most famous uh, pieces in this uh, area of, of Rimsky Korsakoff. Now, Saint Saint. Now, I know, I think Michael showed this one too. And this sparked a memory for me because I used to have this piece of music and I'm still trying to find that version of it because I don't I no longer have it during my mid-90s purge I got rid of a bunch of classical records uh, because I figured CD is a better format for the genre in some cases it may be it just depends um, but Saint Sans Symphony number no. three is considered this massive organ piece has the lowest depth sound of an organ that you've ever heard in your life on parts of it I had a version, and, and help me now, maybe Michael can help me, you may know of it. All I remember, it had a silver metallic cover. And I can't remember if it was an Angel or London. It wasn't RCA, and it wasn't Columbia, and it wasn't Deutsche Grammophon. It was metallic, and it was this piece of music, St. Sons. I don't remember who the um, conductor was who performed it, but um, when you mentioned this on your video, uh, and you talked about the deep organ, it triggered a memory of me having that record. And I used to love to play that record when I first got my JBL L100 speakers that are kind of boomy, bass-heavy speakers uh, in a way. I would turn that out, and the neighbors downstairs would hit the broom on the, their ceiling and our floor. Remember, another man's ceiling, one man's ceiling is another man's floor. And they used to, it, it would shake, it, the windows would shake when I would blast that record out of my Yamaha uh, amp into those JBLs. 
but having this now is really, really great. Um, I mean, there's so many other composers. I didn't even mention uh, the late Johan Johansson, someone I got turned on to uh, by Michael I noted in archive. I have two of his records now, and this is, I think, the better of them. 12, no, this is 12 Conversations with Theo Hilsner. I think the other one's, I forgot the name of the other one right now. He also did this bizarre, the soundtrack to this bizarre movie last year called Mandy with Nicolas Cage, talking about drug-fueled, psychedelic, wacko, creepy-ass movie Mandy. But I think it was the last soundtrack that he did before his uh, late demise. And he wasn't, I think he's only in his 40s. So that's a little classical. It's it's very disjointed because it's all over the place. It's what I have in my collection. I don't go through um, all these composers. But um, hope you liked it and hope you stuck through it. And uh, check out some of this music. But go watch Poetry in Plastic and his 25 records to start a classical collection. I think that's a good place. A really good place to start. And thank you for the um, inspiration, Michael and Michael and Michael in Germany as well. All of you uh, really appreciate it. So uh, this is beautiful music, and it's and uh, I think it's long overdue that it gets some love here in the vinyl community. Mazzy loves you. Thank you, everyone.